Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. First question from Maurice Corrie. Thank you, officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Water Safety Scotland regarding its work and with local authorities to promote water safety and drowning prevention. Minister Ash Denham. Firstly, I would like to pass on my sincere condolences to the loved ones of the two women who sadly died in Aberdeen on Good Friday. The Scottish Government has supported Water Safety Scotland since the launch of their drowning prevention strategy in 2018. My officials are meeting with Water Safety Scotland and the Royal Life Saving Society this week as part of our continuing engagement. And while it is for local authorities to agree their own policy on water safety, last October I wrote to all community safety partnerships to support their work and to promote water safety. Maurice Corrie. I thank the uh, Minister for her answer, uh, yet with the upcoming year of coasts and waters in 2020, does the Minister agree with me that Scotland's waters must be promoted in the safest possible way, especially considering Rossborough's research, which shows that 60% of Scottish local authorities do not have a water safety policy? Minister. I do. Obviously, um, Scotland has, I think it is 90% of all the standing fresh water in the UK but we want people to be able to enjoy um, the amazing um, countryside of Scotland, but in a safe way as possible. So over the last five years, the Scottish Government has provided ROSPA over £600,000 in funding to deliver its annual home and water safety programme. And this year, we are providing funding of £112,000, which will help support delivery of the commitments set out in the drowning prevention strategy. We've also proactively supported the implementation of this strategy and so we have funded and distributed water safety educational material to 2,500 school children before the summer break last year in partnership with ROSPA and Water Safety Scotland. We've hosted a ministerial roundtable with Water Safety Scotland and sporting governing bodies in June last year. A range of actions were agreed around data sharing, local authority engagement and education and awareness raising which are being progressed by Water Safety Scotland. And just to reiterate on my earlier answer, I also wrote to all the community safety partnerships to encourage them to do all they can as well with Water Safety Scotland to support and implement this strategy. Question number two, Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the Electoral Commission regarding encouraging EU citizens living in Scotland to register to vote in the forthcoming European Parliament elections. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Hey, Presiding Officer, I wrote to David Liddington, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, on the 3rd of April to express my concern that citizens of EU member states might not have sufficient time to complete the UC1 form, which will allow them to vote at the European parliamentary elections in the UK. If you, EU citizens do not have time to complete and return these forms, then they will be disenfranchised and will not be able to vote on the 23rd of May. I'm pleased to note that the electoral registration officers in Scotland have now contacted all registered EU citizens to encourage them to complete the forms. Scottish Government officials are participating in weekly meetings of the Electoral Commission Advisory Board where planning for the European Parliament elections is discussed. The Electoral Commission's public awareness campaign will encourage all eligible electors, including EU citizens, to register to vote by the 7th of May deadline in order to take part in the elections and I would encourage all citizens to register and to make sure they are registered by the 7th of May. I thank, Sandra the, White. I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, EU citizens living in Scotland make a hugely positive contribution economically, culturally and academically as I have at Glasgow University in my constituency. I know how much they actually put forward there. Would the Minister agree with me that the shambles at Westminster makes the case for an independent Scotland absolutely essential, uh, where we welcome and value those who chose to make Scotland their home and the forthcoming European elections offers the opportunity for everyone living in Scotland to again reject Brexit. Therefore, it is imperative uh, those that are eligible to vote, to register to vote by the 7th of May. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has made it very clear since the result of the EU referendum that EU citizens are welcome in Scotland. They contribute an enormous amount. We want them to stay and we'll support them to stay. Of course, one of the great advantages of independence will be the ability to tailor immigration policy for Scotland's needs and to do away with the UK government's deplorable hostile environment approach. The member is, as she has said, the rep representative of Glasgow University. Our university sector, 25% of the staff in the research 
side of universities are from other EU countries. In, for example, the, uh, the abattoir sector, 60% of the employees and 95% of the vets. I could go through, presiding officer, a whole range of sectors, I know you rather I didn't, that pointed out the dependence upon EU labour. And indeed, in rural Scotland, that dependence is particularly great. It is an appalling thing to be pleased that freedom of movement is coming to an end, and it will be very damaging for Scotland if that is allowed to happen. Question number three, Neil Findlay. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it will assess the impact of fishing protection orders on trout and salmon stocks in rivers and lochs. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. The Scottish Government has no current plans to undertake a review of the 14 fisheries protection orders which are in place. Neil Findlay. Uh, we are told that we live in an uh, era of evidence-based policy making. So given the decline of salmon stocks on rivers with protection orders on them, uh, will the Cabinet Secretary now instruct an independent scientific review of the impact of protection orders on uh, fish stocks in Scottish rivers and lochs? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the Scottish Government does a number of things which are uh, in, in connection with particularly uh, the, the situation of salmon. I'm very aware of Mr Findlay's concerns uh, around protection orders, but I've indicated uh, that there are no current plans to review the orders. Uh, and I understand uh, from the information that I've been given that we have been giving full answers to his points uh, when he has raised them uh, earlier uh, in the year. I appreciate his concerns about trout and salmon stocks, but the protection orders are actually most relevant to freshwater fisheries, and we do have specific conservation measures in place for the protection of Atlantic salmon. Question number four, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the efficiency of ScotRail services using Stirling Station. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. President Officer, in the preceding 13 rail periods, Network Rail was responsible for half of all delays impacting on services calling at Stirling Station. ScotRail was responsible for 44%. £159 million has been invested in electrification, introducing brand new electric services to Stirling. From May, all Glasgow Stirling Alloa services will see six extra services per day, longer formations providing 4,000 extra seats per day. On the Edinburgh Stirling Dunblane service, there will be two extra services per day, with longer formations providing 1,500 extra seats per day. ScotRail must now deliver its remedial plan, monitored by Transport Scotland with independent oversight from a railway operations expert. Dean Lockhart. Uh, let me remind the Cabinet Secretary that ScotRail data for March showed that less than 60% of trains terminating at Stirling Station were on time, with 40% classified as late. Notwithstanding his assurances that everything possible is being done to remedy this, does he agree with my constituents that the current level of service from ScotRail is unacceptable, and does he have a real plan to fix this? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, what the member ignores is the impact infrastructures had on those particular figures during March, where there were significant challenges with both, uh, uh, with both uh, points and signalling issues in the Edinburgh area that had a very detrimental impact on performance over the March period. However, having said that, uh, where ScotRail have to make their improvements, it's important to do so, and as I've outlined in terms of the timetable changes in May, how that will enhance seating capacity on the particular routes that are serviced by uh, Stirling Station, uh, and why they also now have to make sure they implement their uh, a, a remedial plan. But as I've uh, said on a number of occasions in this chamber, President Officer, we need to make sure that both parts of a railway are operating effectively, and that means that Network Rail need to address the infrastructure issues that continue to have an impact on passenger services. And Bruce Crawford. Well, sir, is the Cabinet Secretary aware that whilst there has been disruption caused by ScotRail's performance, another major reason for disruption of passengers in the Stanley area is signal failure? Responsibility for signalling lies fairly and squarely at the door of Network Rail, which is, of course, fully reserved to Westminster. Cabinet Secretary, do you agree responsibility for rail should be entirely devolved so we can have a joined-up railway system in Scotland and ensure that Network Rail is accountable to this Scottish Parliament? Here, here. Cabinet Secretary. Second officer, the member makes a very good point. As I pointed out to Dean Lockhart in the course of his supplementary question is that very often members are keen to point out the failings of ScotRail and rightly so and they should be held to account for these matters 
but at times they are very reluctant to point out the failings of network rail and impact that has on passenger services. Um, I've uh, made it very clear uh, that the existing structural uh, system that we have for providing rail services in Scotland is no longer suitable to serve uh, the travelling public. And that's why we need to see the full devolution of railway services in to uh, the Scottish Parliament and to the Scottish Government so we can ensure that both parts of our rail network, ScotRail and also the infrastructure provider Network Rail, are accountable to this Parliament and to this Government and we can make sure that it's addressing the issues that need to be addressed sooner rather than later. Question number five, Graeme Simpson. Ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle violent crime. Minister Ashton. <laughs> I thank the member for raising this issue and he will be aware that over the last few months Scotland's groundbreaking public health approach to violent crime over the past decade or so has been subject to much praise from across the UK and also internationally. Violent crime is reducing in Scotland and since 2006-07 recorded violent crime in Scotland has fallen by 49% to one of the lowest levels seen since 1974. Now that is welcome. But no level of violence is acceptable, and that is why we are continuing to invest in the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, Medics Against Violence, and Youth Link Scotland, and their many partners to deliver violence prevention programmes to tackle violence wherever it persists across Scotland. Graeme Simpson. Can I thank the Minister for, for that answer? Um, but last week, Scottish Government statistics showed that in South Lanarkshire, Offences in which a firearm was alleged to have been involved increased by 150% since 2015-16. And that's the largest increase in Scotland by a mile. In North Lanarkshire, it went up by 40%. So would the Minister agree this is unacceptable and endeavour to find out what is being done to stem the tide across Lanarkshire? Minister. I thank the member for raising that issue. Um, I would agree that no level of firearm use in Scotland is acceptable and in or we are doing everything we can in order to reduce uh, that across Scotland and I will write to the member with very further details on that but I would say that police officer numbers in Scotland remain significantly above the level inherited in 2007 and that is obviously one way that we would combat that. The number of officers in Scotland has risen over 900 since March 2007 where there has been a reduction of almost 20,000 officers yeah. in England and Wales. So, as usual, the uh, rhetoric, presiding officer, from the Conservatives on this issue does not match their record. Exactly. Yeah. Gillian Martin. Thank you, presiding officer. While figures for many violent crimes in Scotland are going down, for sexual offences, they continue to rise. Sexual crimes are now the highest level seen since 1971. They affect Scotland's women the most. Can I ask what steps the Scottish Government are taking to tackle the decades-long rise in sexual offences, but also what they're doing to ensure that women get support to bring their attackers to justice? Minister. I thank the member for raising what is a very important issue. There are, of course, a range of reasons that lie behind the increase in recorded sexual crime, and those include a greater willingness of victims to come forward, uh, more historical reporting and the impact of new legislation. The Scottish Government provides support for victims through targeted funding, legislative improvements and partnership working with agencies and stakeholders. We are of course implementing Equally Safe, our strategy for preventing and eradicating violence against women and girls and our Equally Safe delivery plan contains 118 commitments to achieve this. In 2015, the First Minister announced a £20 million Violence Against Women and Girls Justice Fund to improve the experience of victims and the outcomes of those experiences. The fund also supported prevention and early intervention work, and those aims continue to inform our funding strategy. And Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Minister advise us what the level of violent crime is in Scotland compared to south of the border, where Mr Simpson's party is in power? <laughs> Minister. I thank the member for uh, that question, but unfortunately comparing levels of violent crime in Scotland with south of the border is not a simple process and this is because the use of differing definitions and collection methods for the data in both 
um, recorded crime and also our respective surveys. But our statistics demonstrate that we have seen significant decreases in the levels of violence across Scotland. And since 2006-07, we have seen a 49% decrease in recorded violent crime, a 51% drop in the number of victims of homicide, and a 55% fall in the total number of emergency admissions to hospital resulting from assault. Question number six, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to tackle the issue of roadside litter. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Littering is unacceptable. Roadside litter is unsightly. It presents a danger to other motorists and to the operatives cleaning it up. There's also a significant cost to the taxpayer taking valuable resources away from other public services. On 3rd April, I announced my commitment to bring forward legislation in the future Circular Economy Bill uh, that will create a specific offence of littering uh, from a vehicle. This will allow for a fixed penalty to be issued to the registered keeper of the vehicle if the responsible individual cannot be identified. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for a reply. Um, clearly, the introduction of DRS will have a positive and welcome impact on reducing roadside litter. Uh, and those of us supportive of DRS for some time, in my case, since I saw it operating in Norway way back in the mid-80s, are keen that there is no slippage in the timescale for introduction of the scheme. Can the Cabinet Secretary assure the Chamber that the timeline for introduction of DRS is still on track and advise when we are likely to know whether or not glass will be included in the scheme from day one? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, we are on track. The commitment to establishing a deposit return scheme is well established. It's central to our wider circular economy ambitions, but of course it's also uh, central to the contribution it can make to climate change emissions reductions. We continue to make progress with the design of the system, uh, informed by last year's extensive public consultation and the ongoing engagement we've had with a wide range of stakeholders. And we intend to set out next steps with the scheme's implementation shortly uh, during which all will be revealed. Morris Golden. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Fewer than half of the litter fines issued in the three years up to 2018 were actually paid. Given that, what assurance is there that this new measure on roadside litter will be enforced any better? Cabinet Secretary. Well, enforcement uh, clearly is always an issue when it comes to uh, any uh, particular change in the law, not just this one. Um, the intention is to uh, provide the enforcement authorities uh, with the ability to go after a registered keeper uh, and not have to go through the process of trying to establish who precisely in the car uh, did the littering, at which point, if they cannot do that, it stops. At that point, there will be a, a, an issue for the registered keeper. And we are hoping that that provides uh, a better uh, and more uh, appropriate way in order to deal with the problem of uh, littering from cars. Question number seven, Donald Cameron. To ask the Scottish Government what representations it has made to Ofgem regarding its consultation on the proposed Western Isles interconnector. Minister Paul Wheelox. The Scottish Government continues to work closely with Ofgem and others with an interest in the proposed transmission link to the Western Isles. I'll be submitting a response to Ofgem's consultation, reiterating our strong support for a 600 megawatt link. Uh, I have written and spoken to Dermot Nolan, Ofgem's chief executive, stressing that a 600 megawatt link could help to unlock the considerable renewables potential in the Western Isles, including from community-based projects, and that this opportunity mustn't be squandered. And I'll reiterate these points when I meet Ofgem's chair, Martin Cave, next week. Donald Cameron. Given that a 600 megawatt interconnector would greatly benefit local community groups by allowing them to develop their own wind power projects due to the extra capacity, will he join me in calling on Ofgem to strongly reconsider the case for a 600 megawatt interconnector? Minister. Well, I certainly support the, the marks that Donald Cameron made. I've already urged uh, Ofgem to reconsider this position. I will continue to do so. Uh, in terms of the, the formal submission that we'll make. Um, but uh, as, as the member indicates, uh, we recognise that in the Western Isles and in the other island groups, the interconnections are absolutely vital to deliver the kind of community economic development opportunities that we know renewable energy can bring to the islands when there are uh, scant uh, other opportunities to do so. So it's very important that we work together to make sure those links are installed and they provide sufficient opportunity to develop the economies of all three island groups. Alistair Allen. While I very much welcome Mr Cameron's support for this project of huge importance to my constituency, I do have to point out gently that it comes on the back of a near decade of intransigence by his Conservative colleagues in the UK government. 
Does the Minister agree with me that Ofgem should give proper consideration to the enormous socio-economic benefits the proposed interconnector would unlock? And would he also uh, urge other politicians, particularly those on the Conservative benches, to make that argument very strenuously to the UK Government and its Energy Minister? Minister. The member makes a, a very important point. Dr Allen, obviously, as the local member, uh, is well aware of the potential for economic development in the Western Isles arising from this investment. Uh, we will certainly make these points in the submission. I've given absolute commitment to Dr Allen to do that. Of course, Ofgem is not directly accountable to this parliament, uh, so it is absolutely important that members across this chamber, especially our co colleagues in the Conservative benches, can use influence to try and encourage UK ministers to put their own uh, own thoughts into uh, Ofgem's consideration and we are urging Ofgem to consider the full range of benefits that links would provide and which we believe should be taken into account in its assessment in these cases. We also believe this will not only develop the economy of the West Isles but deliver cheaper energy for GP consumers as well so it makes sense in both fronts. And Rhoda Grant. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will be aware that Ofgem only take account of potential generation that is in the planning process and therefore community schemes which are not in the planning process because they can't afford to do that until there's capacity in the system won't be taken into account. What is the Scottish Government doing to measure the potential generation by communities in order to inform Ofgem's decision? Minister. Well, the member raises an important point. We are working very closely uh, through uh, the, the channels of the care scheme to try and support communities with projects. But she is absolutely right that without the good connection, that undermines the argument for investment. So it's vital we have the good connection in the Western Isles to allow uh, projects which have been grid constraints since 2007, which has been a major constraint in development in the Western Isles to take place. We do know that between Lewis Wind Power and uh, Eusinus uh, projects uh, in, in Western Isles that are 360 megawatts are already in, in the planning system there, and further. Uh, capacity uh, is also uh, in terms of the Lethen Wind Farm uh, is another uh, consented project so that's another 49 megawatts so in total over 400 megawatts are already in the system and we believe that Ofgem should be a bit uh, less risk averse in, in pushing the boundaries on what is possible. The, the area has a huge potential for renewables and clearly we believe many more projects could come forward. 